communicating. Is this recording the video as well? I assume so. Let's hide this. All right. Um, visualizing numerical data. Let's start by talking about dot plots and box plots. When we have some numerical data, we frequently want to look at it. I'm a big fan of visualizations, graphs, plots, charts, all the same kind of thing. So learning objectives is to learn how to do this kind of stuff. Now, when you want to look at a single variable at a time, there are actually a lot of options, but this lecture will just talk about two, dot plots and box plots. This might look familiar to some of you a little bit. So one numerical variable. Dot plots are about as easy as it gets. You draw a number line, horizontally or vertically, whatever. Usually it's horizontal. And then you put your data on it in dots. Every, every observation is one dot. You just put it on there. And you can get fancy if you want. You can use colors if the dots are overlapping. So here are a bunch of student heights uh, from one of my classes a few years ago. You can see here that this person was maybe 48 inches tall. This is not... Um, a data error. We had a few people that short, and this person is quite tall. Now I made like a rainbow color here, so that high values are red and low values are more blue, middle values are purple. Well, that's actually pretty silly. Nobody needs to do that. It was just fun to do in R. Um, but I also used some semi-transparency, which is quite helpful, so you can see when a number of dots overlap each other. That's quite handy because you need to know if there are lots of dots in the same place because that tells you something about your data. Here's uh, an example from our open intro textbook, so that's the supplemental materials that come with it. Here are a bunch of counties, uh, and each county has a median income, so an average income in each county. So what each dot is one county. I can't remember exactly what the sampling space was here. Anyway, they put a little doohickey thing there to show you the mean. That's a little extra frill. But basically the dots, one dot per county. So this county right here, the, the median income is below $20,000. That is a poor county. Here the median income is almost 50000 and that's a much more middle class type county. So much more common than a dot plot is a box plot. A dot plot is something you can doodle on a napkin easily. A box plot is something that requires a little bit more work and if you're doing it by hand, it only takes a few minutes if you know what you're doing. But if you're doing it with a computer, it only takes a few seconds. A box plot is a way of representing five important numbers. Now, we're, they're not the most important numbers, but these five numbers can tell you a huge amount about your data. The, you get two of the numbers, the minimum and the maximum values in your data, so your lowest value and your highest value. Those are important, right? And then you have quartiles, and we're going to have to talk a minute about what quartiles are so that you can understand them. A quartile is a place on the number line. It's a division point that divides up your data into four groups, each of which has the same number of observations or the same n in it. So wherever you, and then those lines will shift around based on whether your numbers are, whether your observations are all clustered in one point or spread out or something like that. So Q1 is what we call the first quartile, the first division point. That's the point on the number line where one quarter of your data, one quarter of your observations are below that point, and three quarters are above it. Q2 is the middle point. It's also known as the median with an N. And that's where you have half of the data below it and half of the data above that point. So that's the dividing point that divides your data perfectly in half. And then Q3 is above that. That's where you have three quarters of the data below and one quarter above. It's kind of like Q1, but on the other side. So let's do a little quick... Uh, rundown of what quartiles are. I don't need you to know how to calculate them, but you should understand what they are. So let's say you have an extremely simple example. You have four students in your class, and these are their scores on a test. One got an 82%, one got 84, another got 88, another got a 90. See if you can figure out where the quartiles might be. Basically, just dividing things up super evenly. One quarter of observations are in this range. In other words, one observation. There's only four, so one quarter of them is just one. Another quarter of them are here, another quarter of them are here, another quarter of them are here. So the median is the place that splits them. And you don't need to know this, but there's little rules like if it's if the median falls between two observations, you just evenly split that space. So an 84 and an 88, the middle point is 86. So Q2, or the median, is 86. Q1 is 83. And Q3 is 89. So those are the dividing points for four observations. 
we can imagine a little bit more complex situation where we have 24 scores. Now 24 is nice and divisible. You have six scores and six and six and six. You can divide it in four easily. So it's a good one for demonstrating purposes. You can make a box plot in these quartiles out of any number of scores, but it's easier to demonstrate like this. So this is where 24 different students scored on a test. The lowest one scored a 74. The highest one looks like they got almost, uh, well, maybe a 93. So uh, one quarter of observations are these six right here. So there's going to be a dividing line there. The next quarter is these six observations here, then these six, then these six. So those dividing points, there's the median. And as it turns out, the median is uh, 84.5. And I should have shifted that a little to the left. Anyway, 84.5 is the median, closer to 84 than to, than to 86 for sure. You don't need to know the rules for doing that. All you should know is that my dividing point should have been a little to the left there. Uh, Q1 is 81.5 and Q3 is 88.5. So those numbers evenly divide the data set into four groups of six observations each. So looking back at the student height data, we can get more information about the, the shape and the spread of that distribution of numbers by looking at the quartiles. There they are, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And this makes a box plot. See, Q1, Q2, and Q3 make the box part of the box plot. Q2 divides the box in half. Q1 and Q2, or Q3 that is, they, they show the ends of the box. The median is Q2, so you just make a line perpendicular to whatever axis you're using. One little line for Q2, one line for Q3, one line for Q1. And that's your box. And that shows you what's going on in the middle of the data. If that um, median number is not centered, then that tells you that things are slanted, that the, that the middle of the data is skewed. And then you have these whiskers. This is sometimes called a box and whiskers plot. These whiskers, here's one whisker and that's its end and here's another whisker, and that's its end. Now, in, a, in an absolute sense, we usually say the whiskers are the minimum and the maximum, but actually it turns out it's really useful for us to see if there are kind of little lost sheep wandering away from the, the data set, outliers potentially, values that um, are extreme. And so we have rules for saying if there's stuff that's a certain distance beyond the box, then we put the, dis they put, we put the whisker a little early so we can show those outliers. So we have these two outlier dots on the bottom. It's interesting, we have outliers on the bottom, but not on the top. So those are the potential outliers, and the software is pretty smart about that, so if it thinks there might be outliers, then go with that. They, they might be outliers. That's pretty reasonable. So here's an anatomy of a box plot from the open intro supplemental materials. This is a vertical box plot. You've got your lower whisker and your upper whisker. Now, if there are no outliers, the lower and the upper will be the minimum and the maximum value in your data set. But if there are numbers that are values that are kind of extreme, that aren't well represented by the group here, and there's little rules that the computer will use for deciding that, then you represent them by themselves and you put the whisker early, not quite at the maximum or the minimum or something. And so here you can see that there's a very strong skew in the data. Most of the values are down here. Uh, these are red lines instead of blue circles. I'm not sure why. But anyway, the box plot shows that most of the data, half of the data, are below, uh, I don't know, about an 8. The other half go all the way from 8 up to, like, 65. So the box plot represents that by showing you that this whisker is long, this whisker is short, this median line is not centered in the box, it's squished down towards here. So one quarter of the data are here, one quarter are here, one quarter are here, one quarter are above this. So you can tell an awful lot about what's going on from a box plot. You can tell the average, so the middle, that Q2, is a very common kind of average. You can tell the spread of the data, like how far the data points are spread around each other. Is it a tiny box with long whiskers, meaning the data are clustered in the middle with a few spreading out? Or is it a big, big box with short whiskers, which means that things are spread out pretty evenly across the range? You can tell skew, which is sort of uh, whether the data are kind of lumped up to one side or the other. So is the median line in the center or shifted? And then is the box in one end of the whiskers with a long whisker, or in the other end with a long whisker? Is there asymmetry going on there? 
and then it'll tell us whether there are potentially outliers. And then it's interesting to know whether there are asymmetrical outliers. Asymmetry is, a, is a, an important thing to pay attention to here. So here are some more box plots. Here are some, I don't know what the SL, NW, and SH is, but you can tell that this is symmetrical except for this outlier here. This is really not symmetrical. This is lumpy and skewed down here, down to this direction, but you've still got these outliers. But there's got to be more data here. Otherwise, there would be dots here too. And this is fairly symmetrical from minimum to maximum, but there's a. this is skewed. You've got um, most of the data clumped in this bottom area here. You've got 50% of the data in here. There's the other 50% goes all the way up here. So here's a view of a normally distributed variable, like a bell curve distributed variable, and a non-normal. So this is skewed positively, too many values running off to the positive end, um, or a few values, and then most of the values being more likely to be packed up in the, in the negative end there. Here's uh, results from a famous experiment, which we might see later in the semester for an activity, where people tried to measure the speed of light multiple times, and these are the results of a whole bunch of trials with this method, a whole bunch of trials with th this method. So we can see the average estimate of the speed of light, and we can see that everything overestimated the true speed, which is this red line, and that various methods were more accurate than other methods. And you can even do crazy stuff like this. Look at all of these box plots. This is box, box plots of a whole bunch of tickets, like software, help request, uh, bug type tickets, filed with Wikipedia over a period in 2013. So each box plot is an aggregate of, uh, for the day or for the week, something like that. You can put a whole bunch of box plots next to each other, and you can kind of see a trend. It's kind of a wavy trend there. Oops, I didn't need to press that button. It's a wavy trend here. So there we go, and we're all done.